Today on Something's Happening Here, we look once again to history and scripture to see definitively how God can be involved in these phenomena of rival kings and leaders. And surprise, it's not in the ways that we might think. By looking at all of these examples all week long, all with similar outcomes, we hope to affirm that the course that we're on in America today is simply not good, no matter how much in love we might be with one leader or ideology or another. As believers, we have a responsibility to act as advocates of God's kingdom, even and especially when the world feverishly does the opposite. I'm Steve Hicks. Join me as we travel back in time some 2,900 years on today's show called This Thing Became a Sin. Hello, friends. It is Thursday, and you are really uh, you're sticking with us throughout this week of rival leaders, rival kings, rival presidents, rival popes, even, we looked at. So today we're going to look at one more example of this, mostly from the Bible. So make sure you grab your Bible. Uh, I could just tell you the story, but I would much rather you have the words of God in your brain. So turn in your Bibles to the book of First Kings. So it's really, it's close to the beginning of the Bible, closer than it is to the end. First Kings chapter 12. Um, the book of First Kings begins with the death of King David and the rise to power of his son Solomon as the subsequent king. And we are going to read a story about what happened after Solomon died. His son Rehoboam is um, the king after Solomon. And he gets himself into some trouble pretty early on. So we're going to read that story. Then we're going to go back to chapter 11 to read the context of that story. Then we're going to go back to the end of chapter 12 to see the results of that story. Okay? So join me in chapter 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt. More on that when we go to chapter 11. That they sent and called him Jeroboam. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he, that's Rehoboam, said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. All right, then Rehoboam has a meeting with his elders, and uh, they tell him to meet their request and make their lives easier. But he doesn't like that. So he gets a second group of advisors that tell him the opposite, that he should... Um, Let's pick it up down in verse 10. Then the young men who had grown up with him, that's the second council of advisors, spoke to him saying, thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. You think that went well? No, of course not. So Jeroboam um, came back <laughs> with his people uh, three days later. And verse 15 says, So the king, that's Rehoboam, did not listen to the people. For the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Sh Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. All right, so there's the story. The new king has a request made of him by the people, and he denies the request. As a result, bad things are going to happen. But we're given all these clues about this man Jeroboam and something that happened and a prophet and the prophecy. So we need to go back a chapter and read all of that. Just to let you know, what we're doing is not just learning the story, but we're seeing how God intervenes in the story. Okay? Okay. Because we're going to see that bad things happen, yet God claims responsibility for it at least twice. So the idea, good things 
all good things come from God, all bad things come from Satan. In my heart, I believe that's a pagan idea because God claims ownership of everything. And sometimes that means bad things. So let's go back to chapter 11 and let us read uh, this context story. We'll pick it up in verse 26, chapter 11, verse 26. Then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man, Jeroboam, was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all of the labor force of the house of Joseph. Yeah, that's pretty good. So that's a nice gig, you know, nice promotion. Verse 29. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite met him on the way. And he had clothed himself with a new garment and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for my, the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel. There you go. And the reason given in the next verse is because, um, well, it's because the people rebelled against God. But the reason we were given in the earlier part of this chapter is because Solomon himself rebelled against God. So because uh, Solomon turned to idols and his heart went astray, God said, all right, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. But not until after you die, I'll tear it away from your son out of respect for your father, David, my servant. That's how that went. So, therefore, um, therefore, Jeroboam rebels against, against Solomon. In verse 40, Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam because he's prophesied to be the next king or something. But Jeroboam rose and fled to Egypt. So that's why he's in Egypt when we read the story in chapter 12. And he comes back, he makes the demand of Rehoboam. Rehoboam says, no, what was the result? Now we're going to pick up verse 25 of chapter 12. Then Jeroboam, um, who is now the king of the 10 tribes that rebelled, then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he's worried. He managed to get his power, but he wants to keep his power. And he's worried that if his people in the 10 tribes go down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, that they would want to stay there and become part of Judah again and not be in the northern kingdom where Jeroboam was king. So what's he going to do about that? He has to come up with a way to keep the people away from Jerusalem. What does he do? Verse 28. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one up in Bethel, And the other he put in Dan. Verse 30. This is from where the title of today's show comes. Now this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. For most of the northern kingdom of Israel, um, they were closer to Jerusalem than they were to Dan. So this wicked king Jeroboam built them an alternate worship space in Bethel, which is not terribly far away from Jerusalem. But then everybody up in the north, well, they didn't, (laughs) it's almost like if they went far out of their way, they're committed to what they're worshiping. And so Jeroboam wants to give them a place close 
easy, convenient for them to worship. And he does in the northern city of Dan. Dan was supposed to have the territory in the uh, western part of, of Israel, in the land, in the part of the country that's known as Tel Aviv now. But if you read in Judges, they had some warfare and whatnot. So they <laughs> they took a secondary place up in what is known as Dan now. I have some photos because I went to Jerusalem. I went to Israel back in 2018, and I want to show you photos that I took when I visited Dan. Here is one of the worship space that Jeroboam created. Now you see it's mostly rocks and it's mostly ruins, right? But you'll see in the photo there's a metal structure in the middle of the ruins, and that represents the um, altar of sacrifice that would have been there once upon a time. You can still see the outline of it on the ground, but the altar itself has been destroyed with the eons of time. So the archaeologists created this kind of false one there so we can see what would have been there. And that's a giant altar. I'm reasonably certain that's considerably bigger than the actual altar of burnt offering in the real temple. So it's like he's overcompensating, right? Also, the second photo I want to show you is right next to this worship space are these like secondary rooms. And in one of those rooms is the sign there is put by archaeologists, obviously. But the reason it's there is because this is the only place in the entire country of Israel where the ruins of a incense censer were found. And so that's why you see that photo there. They're they're commemorating the fact that we found an, an incense censer here. It was used in this false pagan worship that Jeroboam set up. So what is the point of this? The point is to show us that not only um, do two rival kings lead to the dissolution of the society. Of course, we've established that kind of over and over throughout the week. But this, this story shows us two things. One, that religion itself can get corrupted, right? When the society falls apart, the people inside of that society lose their sight on larger things. Um, so when we... <laughs> When we read in Revelation 13 about um, the prophecies of what is still to come, uh, we read through it. We're like, oh, but God's people would never do that. But maybe we would. Under the right circumstances, maybe we would. Because God's people a long time ago would, you would say, oh, they'll never not go to Jerusalem. They'll never go to Dan and worship a golden calf instead or an idol. Like, no, that'll never happen. And yet that's what happened. And that's what's going to happen again. Some, I mean, it won't be exactly the same, but that kind of corruption, that kind of adultery is the only thing that can come. This thing became a sin. <laughs> and the reason I chose that as the title is because no matter what happens in this whole Trump-Biden business, no matter what happens to try to solve the problem, uh, no matter what Trump tries to do to become dominant or what Biden and his his people try to do in response, no matter what, whether you like it or hate it, it's going to become a sin. This thing, whatever it is, became a sin. If you are one of God's people, then you orient your life away from sin, not toward it. So this is as clear a clarion call as I know how to give you, that we need to cut this out. Leave the bickering to Fox News and the New York Times, okay? We can't do this. God needs a people that are not mired in all of this stuff. We don't have one king too many, right? We have one king, and his name is Jesus. And if we keep our minds and our hearts on him, we're going to be okay even if the society around us falls apart, even as the society around us falls apart. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the example of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Thank you for showing us that, showing us what can happen when we let politics get where you are supposed to be. And thank you also for showing us that you have a purpose that's not our purpose 
that it was actually your purpose to split Israel into two and to set Jeroboam, a wicked king, over 10 twelfths of your people. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us, but it does to you. And I pray that we will all have that level of wisdom to not just take the thing that we want and love in our hearts and decide that's what you want to, but to actually take the time to determine what it is that you want and then align ourselves with that. Please give us grace and wisdom to do that very thing, Father. Take our hearts away from these rival presidents. Take our hearts away from all this chaos that's leading nowhere good. And establish us in Jesus Christ today and each day until we meet him face to face. Amen. All right. We're four-fifths of the way through the week. Now we just have the big conclusion tomorrow. So make sure you are subscribed on Facebook. That means you're on the Steve Hicks page for now. And I wish I had better news for you, but right now I don't. So go to the Steve Hicks page and like it to become a follower of it. Or if you prefer YouTube, find the Talking Donkey International channel, subscribe to it, and hit the notification bell. If you prefer Rumble, good for you. Find our channel there and hit the follow button. And if you like Locals, which is really just Facebook with fewer rules, <laughs> um, then go join it for free. And uh, if you become a paid supporter, then you can have access to everything. I publish stuff there every week that is not published elsewhere. So God bless you. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to concluding our episode with you again tomorrow. God bless.